Englisch. Uh, I'm from Helmut Center Berlin, BSI 2 and the University of Potsdam. And I'm not here for myself, but for Thorsten Schmidt. So I introduce him a little bit and you will understand later why. Um, Thorsten, he has been doing a diploma in polymer science in Mainz at the Max Planck Institute. So he actually understands molecules, right? He just doesn't show that ever. And then after that diploma, he went to Uppsala University, where I actually got to know him also uh, as student, so to say. Uh, and he was doing a PhD with uh, Josef Nordgren, who is a person who really developed a lot of the um, classical X-ray spectrometers and synchrotrons in the first place. And uh, he has been uh, basically the uh, X-ray emission rig squad, certainly in Europe. And so he has been working with him on correlated oxides, uh, the superconductors and these type of things. Um, and there were seminal papers with people, people like Peter Kuiper, where for the first time uh, one actually saw that there are these type of DD excitations, which was at that time uh, the limit of resolution. It was quite an amazing finding. His direct supervisor was actually Loren Duda, uh, who is also in the audience, and uh, Laurent, uh, right, I guess it paid off, um, after all. Um, and so when he finished his uh, PhD, he got, of course, a, a bunch of the student grant, uh, things. He moved to KTH, at that time building up a Riggs beamline at MaxLab, um, and that was, of course, successful, but then uh, I remember talking to him there, he always talked about high resolution rigs and going to Switzerland and this and that, right? And we said, okay, well, whatever. Uh, and he disappeared a while. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, with people, I mean, Rajkovic, uh, um, Giacomo, uh, Strokov, uh, and so on, you built together a fantastic beam line at the Swiss light source. Um, with, you know, people said it's the last third generation source, but with Swiss precision, and it all paid out, very stable, super high resolution, and, and all of a sudden RIGS became a precision spectroscopy for a lot of solids, and um, as we all know, inelastic neutron scattering was very powerful back then, but they could never see orbital excitations because neutrons don't see charge um, and polarization. And so that was like a real breakthrough uh, to get this thing going. Um, my group, we benefited from it in molecular science. And the reason why I'm saying this is uh, because Thorsten actually receives uh, the mid-career award of the VOV conference, and I really uh, congratulate him on these achievements. And so it's all yours. Your talk, Momentum Resolved, Ricks in Quantum Material. Okay, yeah. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for this very, very kind introduction. So I should get going because otherwise you will interrupt me. So basically you, you took from my time now a lot. So I need to <laughs> get going with the science. Okay, so that's the outline. So that's what I'm going to tell you today. So I will uh, try to make a little bit uh, a small tour, uh, starting with uh, just giving a very, very quick introduction to resonant elastic X-ray scattering for the ones who don't know the technique, mostly for the juniors. All the other ones probably know it. And then I will go into three topics, uh, starting off with the topic of uh, cuprate superconductors, where uh, we, we were doing nice work to show how that you can also, with rigs, uh, disentangle the uh, mixed uh, spin and charge excitations. Uh, in a second topic, I will speak about iron selenide, uh, also a superconductor, so the iron-based superconductor, where uh, we, we were studying the pneumatic correlations and the spin ex excitation anisotropy. And in the last part, I will just speak about uh, how one can probe electron phonon coupling uh, with rigs in uh, transition metal oxides with this example of a rare earth nickelate. So, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, what, what is it? It's a photon in, photon out spectroscopic technique. So, you two tune your energy to a certain absorption resonance indicated here. Of course, you have uh, a certain K vector, which is also then manipulatable by your geometry onto a sample. You inelastically scatter uh, 
we prefer quantum materials. Sometimes we need to do also these molecules with people like Alexander. Um, and then we detect uh, basically the re-emitted or in us, like just get that X-rays with its photon energy under a certain K vector. What we do is we create the electron hole excitation, the valence state, and uh, we transfer by this energy and momentum to the system, and this energy and momentum which you transfer to the system is characterizing now relevant for quantum materials, all of the elementary excitations of relevance for all of their exotic properties, like uh, phonon excitations, magnetic excitations, orbital excitations, and charge excitations. So uh, this is the machine which we are still having at the Swiss Light Source, which Alexander mentioned so kindly. So uh, by now we have up upgraded it a little bit in comparison to the original shape which we built with the Milano group and with EPFL. And uh, we nowadays can still reach routinely a resolving power between 10 and 40,000. Okay, so I dive directly into topic number one, which is uh, unraveling the nature of spin excitations when you disentangle them from charge contributions in a doped, su in a doped superconductor. So th th this is a collaboration of, of my group, uh, where the le leading author is Wen, Wen Liang Zhang, which is also in the audience, uh, with a theory group of Schuster Wolf Wolfeld in, with support of IFW, Nishimoto, and the samples were coming also from Switzerland, from the University of Geneva. So, how now do the spin and charge degrees of freedom shape the phase diagram of the superconductors? You see here on the, on the right the, the typical superconducting phase diagram, uh, where basically uh, you have for very low content of hole doping on these cube rates an anti ferromagnetic long range uh, insulator. And when you now dope the systems either with holes or, or electrons, here we discuss only the hole doping, you form this superconducting dome, and in this superconducting dome above and next to it, they can also occur other peculiar things like a charge order, which can be competing, or uh, also a pseudo gap phase, and so on. And if you uh, dope a lot, you can go in a kind of metallic regime or a family liquid regime. So, so basically, how do we now understand? this uh, doped uh, cube rate superconductors. What is important to understand is that you have basic energy scales contributing, which is the super exchange interactions of the antiferromagnetic correlations and the kinetic energy T. So basically they are in competition depending if you have now small hole doping or larger hole doping. So basically if you have very small hole doping, of course um, you, you have super exchange interaction contributing much over the uh, T energy scale, if you have very high doping, you have the uh, T energy scale dominating over the super exchange. And you have the interesting regime where T is in the order of the super exchange, where you have super, con uh, super connectivity intertwined with other states. So basically, we will tackle a little bit now in this RIG study, this intermediate regime. So um, in literature, uh, of course, uh, early on there was mostly studies uh, of uh, cube rate superconductors with inelastic neutron scattering, which was traditional technique for, for studying spin excitations. Not so easy to, study, to study the high energy spin excitations due to the low uh, intensity of these facilities. But nevertheless, uh, th there's nice studies on uh, now London strontium copper oxide, where they were seeing that the spectral weight at high energy drops quickly, which is actually uh, was suggesting that maybe the spin excitations are not so important now <coughs> for mediating superconductivity, at least by some theory groups. So then there was coming resonant inelastic excess scattering in the game, and we could study these high energy spin excitations uh, with RIGS. Here I quote the work of Mark Dean, which is also in the audience, and he, he was finding exactly for the same LASCO system that actually the high energy spin excitation weight is pretty constant across the whole, whole doping regime. So it's really contradictory to, to these inelastic neutron scattering results. So um, what do we really see in detail? I just quote here work of the Gehring-Gelli group uh, on a uh, BISCO system, so uh, on a two-dimensional ideal cube rate system. Uh, you, you see in principle here nicely dispersing across the brilliant zone 
so-called paramagnon or collect, uh, damped collective spin excitations. And uh, they are basically uh, thought to be arising directly from the magnon excitations of the long-range antiferromagnetic ordered uh, system. So, but this was, of course, questions by some theoreticians, at least, where uh, some theoretician, uh, which is now at, uh, at, at ETH, Demmler, uh, was actually thinking that maybe these uh, high-energy spin excitations are indeed not real spin excitations in terms of magnons or paramagnons, but it's rather electron hole pair excitations uh, plus a spin flip. And so it's basically a little bit unclear, at least to, to the theoreticians, what really uh, we are seeing in, in rigs on a doped cube rate. So what is arising is basically a problem that you have now spin and charge excitations in the low energy part of the rig spectrum, which are even overlapping energy. And this we try now to basically tackle in this study. So how do we do this? We uh, try to do that actually by, we, we call it the asimutal uh, dependence of the risk cross-section method. So and this works in the following way, is that uh, basically you, you write down your complete scattering amplitude uh, basically uh, uh, as the product of the fun fundamental scattering amplitudes and of the uh, product of factors which are uh, telling you about the angular and polarization dependence. Basically, this is, is the idea, and uh, then you, you make a Riggs experiment. So um, these um, uh, fundamental scattering amplitudes, they are known. You can express them as the so-called scattering tensors. So they are well known, so you can really plug that into the, the problem. And if you write it out, you can now see that you can have the intensity of Riggs as a function of each energy of um, what we call an asymmetrical angle and uh, the different polarization as basically the sum of the spin contribution with this Riggs response for the spin and uh, some of the charge contribution with Riggs response for the spin. And what is this angle now here? This is exactly <coughs> the asymmetrical rotation angle. And basically what we do in this experiment, we go in a geometry that we are key, uh, basically fixing the momentum transfer vector, but we approach that momentum tra tra uh, transfer vector uh, with different uh, angular and polarization dependence. And uh, this you can uh, simply do by cleverly uh, putting your sample on a wedge of a given uh, angle, which is then de defining exactly the, sc the uh, scattering vector you are probing. So how does now basically this Riggs response uh, look in theory? So you have um, the Riggs response now plotted as a function of this asymmetrical angle for non-spin flip, that means charge-like excitation and spin flip excitations for the two uh, orthogonal linear polarization of the instant light. And you see that you have a large of contrast between basically uh, now the, the, the spin response, uh, um, um, between the spin response uh, uh, and charge response and also a large contrast between uh, basically the two instant polarizations. But uh, this is just basically the, the pure angular uh, dependence. So you need to then calculate this uh, for a realistic energy and if you uh, do that. For instance, here we calculated for the typical magnon energy of 250 millivolt. You need to include self-absorption. In fact, you see that this contrast is actually getting a little bit washed out. But uh, it's still large enough to try this disentanglement. That's what we did. So basically, we apply this uh, intensity formula for the rigs. And uh, what we now record is basically uh, many, many different rig slices. So uh, here as a function of this asymmetrical angle. So if you will, you by this create uh, a, a huge overdetermined uh, equation system, which you can, can then with high accuracy numerically solve. Hmm. So, okay. So, so we have done that here. So here on the right side, uh, we, we just show now measured values directly for zero electron volt loss, basically here. And you see what now uh, it is contributing in terms of charge and spin response to the total response for the two different polarizations, and the same we do here now for a realistic finite uh, energy transfer of 250 millivolt. When you now solve this equation, you can then <coughs> calculate back and determine your uh, spectral response of spin and charge only, which we show here for two configurations which are prominently used actually for doing rigs. 
so the, the right configuration is the typical one which is used in cube rates where you have a pi instant light and you have this so-called grazing exit geometry and if you now look how much of the spectral response in rigs is now contributed of spin and charge you see that you have of course the dominance of spin but you have still a size, sizable contribution of charge if you go into other also sometimes use geometry where you have a vertical instant light and grazing instant geometry it is much much worse so you see even that there you have actually a 50-50 a, a contribution of spinning charge so there you can really get fooled okay so with this uh, Wen Liang was uh, now uh, basically decomposing the spin uh, spectral function for different momentum transfers what we see here as a function of uh, different doping uh, basically along the superconducting phase diagram uh, we did that both for the pi pi direction pi zero direction and what you see is that actually you have a small asymmetry between the pi pi direction and the pi zero direction where the intensity now in the pi pi direction is is rising steeper the same you can do then of course for the charge and uh, if you then pay attention here you see that actually um, the directions of pi pi and pi zero are kind of uh, inverted in their relative uh, uh, development where actually the pi zero direction for the uh, charge uh, component rigs response is, is deeper uh, rising in intensity and it's more flat for the pi pi direction okay so basically i i summarized here so what, what we see is really then a distinct momentum transfer dependence of the spin and charge excitations summarized here and in order to now reconcile this we uh, were bringing in our collaborators from the University of Warsaw which were now ca calculating with the uh, density matrix randomization group and a TJ like model on a square lattice the, this intensity rigs response for the certain or basically the 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 struct uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, basically spin uh, response the, the, the structure factor of, uh, of the spin for the different dopings uh, uh, across now the brilliant zone. So you, you see a relatively good correspondence between now the uh, calculation with DMIG and our uh, experimental contribution. So um, actually what these theoreticians also found is actually if you now employ <coughs> Uh, uh, basically extended T, T prime, T double prime J model, you get this very, really nice, this correspondence. It gets a little bit worse uh, if you do only the T, T prime J. But uh, what is important to see is actually the TJ model is qualitatively already uh, bringing basically correspondence between what we measure and the theory. And uh, a nice thing in this DMAG is that, that uh, actually now the uh, theoreticians can uh, stop the summation uh, uh, up to certain neighbors because it's a real space method. DMG is a real space method and what they were showing is actually if you now sum around the interaction side uh, up to the third neighbor you get really really good correspondence already which basically tells us that what we are seeing in these doped cuprates are really short range uh, spin correlations going up to the third neighbor on average. Okay so I just wrap up uh, I've shown you how one can do the disentanglement of spin and charge excitations in BISCO. Um, both of them show distinct uh, momentum dependence in, in their intensities and with help of DMAG, uh, DMAG simulations we can kind of confirm what was actually a notion already an assumption before that we are probing here spin uh, short range magnetic correlations and actually these correlations give then rise to the persistent spin excitations seen also up to very high doping. Okay, so we shift the gear and I go to the second topic, which is uh, another superconducting material is iron selenide. Uh, and uh, there it is work which my group has done together with Beijing Normal University with a group of Jing Lu. We collaborate also with Rice University and uh, uh, with Renmin and Xi Yang in, in China. So, so this topic is about what, what um, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very on topic at the moment is pneumatic order. 
And uh, I set out with explaining what one understands now uh, under pneumatic order. Basically, pneumatic order is uh, a breaking of the rotation symmetry and simply an inequivalence in a plane of x and y directions, and in this case, in this case of the iron plane. And you can see that here in this uh, typical uh, cartoon of uh, the, describing, for instance, the barium uh, uh, iron arsenide uh, uh, spin density wave parent compound of iron plictides, which actually has a, a spin order which is in uh, one direction ferromagnetic and in the other direction antiferromagnetic. And that's uh, exactly what one understands now uh, under a pneumatic state, basically. So what does it mean now, <clears throat> not in real space, but in, in momentum space? Or what does it mean for the magnetic susceptibility? If you measure magnetic susceptibility, you would find when you are not in a pneumatic state, where basically above the temperature of the pneumatic state, you would see a total uh, equivalence of the x and y directions in the magnetic response. And if you go now in a pneumatic state, you have an inequivalence simply of the magnetic response along x and y direction. So a short introduction to iron selenide. You see the structure here. So it's a <coughs> superconductor which has actually just in bulk 8 Kelvin of uh, superconducting temperature, but it can be enhanced to 70 Kelvin if you put it on uh, in the form of a very thin film, mostly on STO. That means the TC is highly tunable. Uh, peculiar of it is that it has no long-range magnetic order. So it is not long-range magnetic order, which is different compared to the cuprate superconductors. So and what do we now expect in terms of re response uh, on, this magne magne uh, on, on this pneumatic uh, fluctuations with different um, uh, techniques? So you can apply uh, simply resistivity, then you can see that uh, your, your resistivity will have a kink, basically. It will have an anisotropy. Uh, you, you can directly look with diffraction at the autorhombic lattice distortion. So you see that you have an autorhombic lattice distortion when you have a structural transition, and that's exactly the, the pneumatic uh, temperature. Uh, you, you can then calculate out what one calls this pneumatic susceptibility, uh, which is diverging at this pneumatic uh, uh, temperature. And of course, you can look at ARPUS and see <coughs> that you have a large reconstruction uh, of the Fermi surface when you are crossing the pneumatic ordering transition. So what is now the question is, what is the origin of the electronic nematicity? Because, of course, this could be driven uh, either by the orbital or by the spin degree of freedom. And uh, um, we would like to see then, of course, the correlation between the magnetic excitations, nematicity, and maybe a little bit later, superconductivity, if we have better manipulators where we can cool more. So uh, what is known in literature, uh, one can look with NMR, actually, on this system, and one looks at the spin relaxation rate, and uh, they, they are actually saying that uh, there is nothing happening in the spin relaxation rate and suggest that uh, the, this pneumatic transition would be rather triggered by orbital degree freedom. You can look at the spin resonance with inelastic neutron scattering, which has been done. Uh, you, you basically can then plot the T-dependence of the spin resonance, and you see that the, the, this makes basically order parameter like onset if you go in, 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 in this uh, regime. And here, actually, this is the, in that case, first the order parameter for the superconductivity. Um, so you can uh, uh, also go at lower energy with inelastic neutron scattering. You see then a strong interplay with uh, spin excitations at 2.5 eV and the pneumatic transition. Similarly, as for the superconducting transition, you see an onset of the pneumatic transition uh, also with uh, inelastic neutron scattering. So uh, in order now to understand this uh, pneumatic spin correlations, you would need to first detwin iron selenide because iron selenide grows always in twin form. So well, how you do that, uh, you, you, uh, you could just put it into kind of uh, a system where you just uh, apply a screw and just press the system to detwin. Uh, this is unfortunately for iron selenide not possible because it's very soft, so you would destroy the material. But, but the trick is then you can very nicely detwin 
beim RNAs night simply by putting this on axle pressure with the help of a screw. You can detwin beim RNAs night and if you now can glue iron selenide on top of it, you indirectly detwin uh, the iron selenide. That has been done by my friends from the neutron scattering community since, since long, so they developed this technique uh, and also validated it with uh, basically looking now at the ratio <coughs> of detwinning by monitoring the nuclear Bragg peak, and I see that they can nicely get a ratio of 50%, so this is working very well, this method basically of in indirectly detwinning uh, the iron selenide by gluing on top of barium iron arsenide. So, uh, when doing that, the neutron people, they see anisotropic spin fluctuations, both when they look at the, the spin resonance, basically. Um, so they, they see uh, in a superconducting and a normal state that they have really very anisotropic spin response. Um, when they now go as a function of uh, uh, spin fluctuation energy, they see that actually the, the intensity of... Uh, the, the spin excitations is, is, is rather monotonically increasing, and basically uh, for 8 millivolt they have seen a really, really large contrast between the 1-0 and 0-1 direction, so a large anisotropy of the low energy spin fluctuations. Okay, so we prepare now this experiment a la neutron in our rig spectrometer, so basically here this shows how you can detwin on the sample holder, the barium iron arsenide. Then uh, we glue on top the iron selenide, and then we just detwin this and go for Riggs investigation. So um, what, what, what you see here is basically the, the cross response of iron selenide. The iron-based superconductors are actually having in their response not so much of low energy, medium energy, well-defined Raman excitations, but a lot of response due to the fluorescence. So what you need to do then is kind of get rid of this fluorescence by understanding it. And uh, we have a couple of years ago already understood how we could nicely parameterize actually the fluorescence response and, and, and fit it. And by this basically we can make a fit to the fluorescence, fit to the electron hole pair tail, which is between the very low energy regime and the tail of the fluorescence. And uh, basically deconvolute now. Uh, the Riggs response, even if you are now looking at rather internal systems, which is quite nice. So basically, the whole intensity is then contributed from fluorescence, uh, the S of Q and omega, and the elastic line. And the S of Q and omega, basically the spin response, you, you understand by uh, what we call the damped harmonic oscillator function, which is common basically to express spin excitations. Uh, in particular also for inelastic neutron scattering nowadays, Riggs does the same. So you see here the Riggs map as a function of instant energy across the resonance, and here the energy loss, and you see clearly dominance of this magnetic, uh, of this fluorescence, but you see for on the resonance, basically here's the absorption spectrum, when you excite with the instant energy on the resonance, you get close to the elastic line, a very clear response of these spin excitations. So we first uh, validated our method also by just uh, recording uh, the uh, barium iron uh, arsenide uh, anisotropic spin response because th this is the spin density wave system and should have very clear anisotropy. It's, it's simply expected. And when you do now basically this, you record uh, after the twinning the barium iron arsenide spectra uh, along H or K direction, you see very, very clear spin anisotropy, which is expected because it's exactly the spin structure of this compound. So basically, the method is working, and we can record spin waves in D-twin barium iron arsenide, which actually can be understood both in Heisenberg model, but also with RPE plus U, U calculations, basically both uh, strong interaction, but also uh, internal pictures are explaining it. Okay, so we move then to iron selenide and did exactly the same experiment. And you see that actually the, the spin excitation anisotropy is even larger here. And this is remarkable because if you remember what I said in the beginning, is here you have not a spin density wave system, you have no long range order, but you have really a spin liquid like uh, phase. So, so it is really, really cool to see the spin excitations having this anisotropy 
in uh, basically H and K direction very clearly. And this anisotropy of the spin excitation is actually at a rather high energy scale because from ARPUS we know <coughs> that the orbital uh, excitation, orbital splitting should be in the order of rather 50 to 70 millivolt or so. So the spin excitations are now uh, uh, showing anisotropy on a very high energy scale around 200 millivolt. But this we basically have <coughs> uh, provided unambiguous evidence for uh, high energy pneumatic spin correlations with uh, soft x rays. Okay, so we go down in more uh, detailed uh, analysis, and uh, the next analysis, after just uh, having now manifested the spin excitation anisotropy, you, uh, you, you should look when this uh, anisotropy is vanishing. So, and then we, we actually would then simply increase the temperature and look when it's vanishing. And what, what comes out is that uh, the spin excitation anisotropy is decreasing, of course, for increasing the temperature uh, towards the the structural transition or the pneumatic transition, and this is disappearing a, even uh, slightly above the pneumatic or, or, or structural transition. So comparing now to a more uh, strong coupling approach uh, of calculating the Riggs response with, in this case, uh, an antiferromagnetic quadrupolar phase, uh, and comparing now the simulations of the anisotropy between H and K directions with the experiment, we, we find very, very nice correspondence. So, so this is really well uh, accounted for. And we, we see that actually then a local moment-based picture describes this nematicity in iron selenite very, very nice. But I should mention that competing other theoreticians also succeeded to just start off uh, with an itinerant approach and include self-energy interactions, basically, and, and also reproduce our spectra later after we had published it. And that we can simply understand that, of course, the iron bit superconductors are neither on the very strong uh, correlation end or the very weak correlation end, but they are just in the middle. So and that also explains that you basically can uh, go in intermediate coupling regime and uh, start off with different theoretical approaches as long as they are meeting up somewhere in the intermediate coupling regime. Okay, I just summarize now the study of the iron-based superconductors. So we um, have observed uh, the magnetic spin correlations in, in uh, bion iron arsenide. The magnitude, the magnitude of this anisotropy is remarkably uh, even larger than the spin density of material of barium iron arsenide. It has a very high energy scale, much higher than the orbital splitting. And we hope to be, uh, and we see that the, sp this, the spin excitation anisotropy disappears even at higher temperature than the pneumatic transition temperature. And uh, taking this together, we think that this is at least a, a solid indication that uh, the uh, pneumaticity in the iron standard is rather spin driven and not orbital driven. Okay, so I go now to the third chapter before Alexander is killing me. I'm doing well. Half an hour I have left? No. Oh, then I was even too, too long. So I, I, I can speak a little bit shorter, a little bit calmer now. Okay, good. So, okay. So the last topic is about how one probes uh, phonon excitations uh, at, in transition metal oxides, and we, we did that on the example of the rare earth nickelates of uh, basically this periscite structure, rare earth nickelates, nickel O3 stoichiometry. So this is a collaboration of my group with University of Geneva, which was delivering uh, um, very high quality thin film nickelate samples. Uh, we measured most of the data actually at the Brookhaven National Laboratory where we have collaboration with uh, people which uh, were formerly also in my group and they are now at Brookhaven National Laboratory with Valentina Bisoni and John, Jonathan Pellicchiari. Uh, also collaboration with University of Zurich and University of Tennessee, Steve Johnson. Okay, so how do we understand the ground state of correlated metal oxides? So uh, there is this so-called uh, uh, Zahnen, uh, uh, Savatsky, uh, Allen diagram, which is categorizing 
now strongly correlated metal oxides in uh, two groups of materials. So there is the, um, the group where your uh, correlation energy U is, uh, is smaller than your charge transfer energy. You see that here to the left, basically U, which is responsible for being able to split the D electron bands in a lower and upper Hubbard band would be now smaller than the energy delta, which is basically the charge transfer energy, which is the energy between the upper Hubbard band and the P band, basically, which is uh, representing a charge transfer between P and D states. So um, that would be called then a mod Hubbard insulator. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the other regime where now the delta is much smaller because the P band is going very is moving up to be very close to the Fermi level. Delta will be smaller than the U parameter and uh, be, because the splitting between lower and upper Hubbard will be large. So in that case, we say that we have by this a positive charge transfer insulator, basically. Mod Hubbard versus, versus charge transfer insulator. Okay, so you can also have <coughs> a different way. So on, 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 the, on the left side, uh, we, we, we have shown the situation where uh, you, you can now actually have a so-called negative charge transfer because you can now basically move your uh, splitting where the family level uh, can be sitting basically in this, in this P-band. And if you then look at these energy scales you, uh, and count them exactly in the same way, you will realize that your delta must be negative. And then we have a negative charge transfer insulator, a negative charge transfer system. And uh, I will show you in a nutshell now that exactly these rare earth nickelates are these kind of systems. So um, how can we find it out? So a couple of years ago, Valentina Bisoni was finding that out when um, she was doing spectroscopy on these films and uh, she was simply now comparing uh, complete RIGS maps. where they look at the complete response of all uh, excitations in all degrees of freedom. You can see basically next to the elastic line, you have a DD excitation response. You have uh, at higher energy up there, charge transfer excitation response. And then if you go higher and higher in terms of instant energy, you get this fluorescence response, which is then not a Raman response anymore. And if you now compare basically the insulating state with the metallic state, you, you see that actually these DD excitations are not changing very much. But uh, what is really changing is mostly actually the charge transfer excitations and in particular kind of a dip between the DD excitations and the fluorescence. So basically all of <coughs> now excitations which are connected rather to oxygen and not uh, to the D band are changing. Uh, this you can also rationalize that actually the DD excitations, they look um, exactly like uh, very similar to nickel oxide, with a, which is the, like the perfect 3D8 uh, charge transfer insulator. So, but how do we reconcile that? Because if you now do actually just the valence number counting, you would see that uh, these rare earth nickelates are D7 and not D8. And we can reconcile in the following way that actually the ground state of this um, metallic rare earth nickelates needs to be nickel 3D8. That means uh, I I around uh, the nickel. So in, at nickel side, it's a 3D8 configuration, similar like the charge transfer insulate nickel oxide, but you have in addition, you have holes at the oxygen. And this is actually this explanation of negative charge transfer because you need to have a negative charge transfer in order to, to take an electron from the oxygen ligand onto the metal band. So by this, we have understood uh, that you have this electronic uh, ground state wave function of nickel 3D8 ligand hole that means the family level is dominated now by the oxygen holes, which are very important. And uh, actually the middle insulator transition in the system, you can nicely understand in terms of the bond disproportionation insulating phase. So that means when you go from the metallic state onto the uh, insulating state, you can form then uh, alternating environments, which are contributed again from uh, nickel 3D8 in, in two plus configuration with two ligand holes or neighboring environments which have no ligand hole basically in a checkerboard kind of fashion. Okay, 
So if we now look at different rare earth nickelates, <coughs> we look at the, at the phase diagram of rare earth nickelates uh, uh, for, for different rare earth uh, ions, which you put for the R here in this uh, formula unit, you, uh, you see that something is changing, what we call the tolerance factor, or effectively the, the angle between nickel, oxygen, nickel is changing very much. And by doing so, <coughs> you can have different categories or regions of this phase diagram where you uh, can be in a paramagnetic metal phase, in a paramagnetic insulator phase, or in the antiferromagnetic insulator phase. You have now th three types of characteristic rare earth nickelates. So the, there is the type which is always paramagnetic. That's, for instance, the lanthanum phase, seen here. There is the type which has now a, actually um, coinciding magnetic and uh, uh, metal insulator transition. So T nil equals T MIT. It's actually near, near dim nickelate. It's situated here. Basically, you can go between antiferromagnetic insulator and paramagnetic metal. And you have the other one, the third category, which is a marium nickelate, where the T nil transition is always smaller than uh, T MIT. This is just sh showing here. Basically, you have a split of the magnetic transition and the metal insulator transition for this. Okay, so how do these systems now look? So basically you have this kind of periscite structure, that means you have nickel O6 octahedra, and um, in the insulating state you have now alternate, so for, from structural characterization, diffraction, you know since long that you have alternate compressed and expanded octahedra. So we call this a breathing distortion, uh, distortion. Uh, or also bond disproportionation of the insulating phase. And uh, um, this breathing distortion is actually going in the same direction as the uh, man magnetic ordering vector, just they are different in a factor two in uh, a length, basically. Okay, so uh, you can now have basically interdependent phase transitions, and how do we understand it? See here, basically the metallic state on the left side in the metallic state, you see that all nickel O6 octahedra are equivalent. You have no breathing distortion in the lattice. Uh, we solved that uh, the electronic ground state wave function need to be nickel 3D8 with a ligand hole. Uh, magnetic uh, uh, phase is a paramagnetic phase. So if you then go basically lower in temperature, um, you see that you have then uh, both uh, coming up for, for many of these compounds, magnetism and the insulating phase, where you have now alternating expanded and collapsed octahedra. And of course, the expanded octahedra, since you need to represent an antiferromagnetic long-range order phase, need to be uh, basically every second one needs to, seats, needs to be either in, in upspin one direction or, or downspin one direction. So basically, you have expanded and collapsed nickel O6 octahedra, the ground state wave function of the insulating phase, as I already said, is nickel 3D8 plus nickel 3D8 plus two ligand holes. And basically, you have then a high spin and a low spin uh, on, on, on these two forms of uh, expanded and collapsed octahedra. High spin is close to S equal 1, low spin is close to S equal 0. So now it's the question, what is the relationship now with the metal insulator transition of the rare earth nickelates and the structural reconstruction? And in particular, you would like to know what is the evolution of the phonon or electron phonon coupling uh, and how is that related to the breathing distortion? Uh, and, and basically that's, I will show you, one can study very nicely with oxygen kerix. Okay, so uh, there was, kind of uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, already a nice theoretical work by the a group of Jeroen Vandenbrink, where they were the, the just showing that uh, in, in a very simplistic one phonon model, as the Einstein model of the phonons, you can represent basically the, the value of the uh, electron phonon coupling, uh, G, in terms of um, self energy divided by the mode energy squared, and basically, what they were demonstrating in this calculation is that, um, that the higher your electron phonon coupling is going, basically, uh, uh, basically parameterized by this value m divided by the mode energy, you see that the more ringing 
you have kind of in your phonon excitations. So basically, if you have a small <coughs> electron phonon coupling, the ringing is basically not going very far. Basically, you have only one or two, for instance, uh, 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 higher harmonics of these phonons. But if your electron phonon coupling is very high, this can look very, very similar to O2 molecule, H2O, or whatever. So, to, to these vibrational excitations in uh, uh, molecules, basically. So, uh, then a little bit later, a clever guy from uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, Keith Gilmore, was coming up that, of course, if you want to uh, understand it in more, more detail, you would need to also then, of course, consider that several of these phonons, because you cannot, uh, often you have not only one optical phonon, but many, and uh, in principle you would also have at some point acoustic phonons at low energy, so of course you, you can interference of them. And the, the easiest case of two phonon interference uh, was just showing here, basically, and then if you have two phonons, one at 50, one at 100, interfere with the same, uh, actually, strength of interference, you, you get already much more complicated spectrum. There is uh, basically now a mathematical framework how to do it, and it's well understood. So basically now, <coughs> we were setting out to do, now uh, solve this for these rare earth nickelates. Uh, at the moment, we don't have yet at least the resolution doing that in an adequate way in Switzerland, so we had to go to the US, going to the Brookhaven National Laboratory and work at the six beam line with Valentina and Johnny. Had a resolution of 15 to 30 millivolt, that is then well enough to well resolved the fine structure of uh, the highest uh, breathing mode phonon, which is at uh, around 60 millivolt. Okay, and that's exactly the, the response you see now. You see it's really like a forest. It's very complicated. It's not, a, not at all like the easy one, one phonon mode, Einstein model. And uh, you have many phonon modes now contributing and interfering with each other. And uh, if you would now do the easy one, Einstein model uh, fitting is, of course, uh, horrible, will not work. But with this interference formula, it works very well. So, um, Tego Asmara, which was responsible for this work, was doing very nice uh, uh, fitting here. And you see that you have, uh, you need to have uh, considered octahedral distortion for non at 30 millivolt in a breathing mode at 60 millivolt. And if you account well for this, you can reproduce all the fine structure peaks which is arising from this combination of the two optical phonon modes. I'm nearly done. Uh, okay. So, we have done that now for the different rare earth nickelates, the one which is only paramagnetic, lantern nickelate, the one which can uh, be, uh, which has uh, I I the same transition temperature of magnetic and the metal incident transition neodymium nickelate and the samarium nickelate, where the t nil is smaller than the TMIT, and that you see just here the response. You see that the samarium nickelate has like a gradual change of this phonon response. The lantern nickelate has nearly no change at all. And the nadium nickelate has basically two sorts of phonon response uh, uh, areas, one at uh, now the, the high energy and one at the low energy. How do we understand that? We can just see that. From the summary here, on the left side you have that for the neodymium nickelate, and you see here the development of the electron phonon coupling when you cross the metal insulator transition and the magnetic transition. At, at the same time, you have a very clear development and a change of electron phonon coupling when crossing this transition. When you now do <coughs> the samarium nickelate, you have nearly no change, and the same for the lantern nickelate. But one sees that actually when you're in the metallic state of lantern nickelate is corresponding very nicely to the high temperature regime of the neod neodymium nickelate. And uh, uh, the samarium nickelate, uh, uh, which is for this regime where we are always uh, insulating, is correspond very nicely to the regime of the insulating state of the neodymium nickelate. So basically we, we have seen now <coughs> that the electron phonon coupling of this neodymium nickelate is uh, drastically decreasing when you cross the metal insulator transition. And what we see in addition is that actually um, the uh, electron phonon coupling decrease is preceding the M MIT. And from this we conclude the electron phonon coupling breathing mode uh, of the neodymium nickelate decreases drastically well below the metal insulator transition. And the disappearance of the uh, breathing lattice reconstruction 
is by this uh, a precursor for the electronic MIT. And just in a nutshell, I do uh, just publicity for my postdocs in the afternoon. Johan Wey will speak more details about Briggs in the magnetic van der Waals system. It's happening in session 15. So if you're interested in magnetic van der Waals materials, have a look. It's very nice data, very impressive how Riggs is uh, able to, to uh, study this kind of magnetic materials. And uh, my postdoc, uh, Wen Liang Zahn, uh, will also in the afternoon speak in session 17 about ferromagnetic kagumi metals, where, where he actually shows how you can use the MCD in Riggs, basically MCD Riggs method to, uh, to resolve magnetic excitation, even be ferromagnetic magnons below the uh, resolution of our instrument, and uh, basically solve a lot of details of this very, very topical material. I just summarize here uh, that I had presented three topics, disentanglement of spin and charge excitations in doped cube rates. Um, I show how high energy spin excitation anisotropic can be studied uh, in this iron based superconducting iron selenide, study nematic correlations. Uh, and I was showing how electron phonon coupling in these rare earth nickelates can be studied. And uh, we, we were seeing that the, for near the nickelate, the electron phonon coupling is decreasing just below the MIT. And we by this think that actually the decreasing electron phonon coupling is so to say, a precursor state of the MIT. Thanks for your patience, Alexander. I'm exactly 50 minutes. The other four minutes yes. was you. It's perfect. It's perfect. Of course, a question to Torsten. I have two questions, and then you have time to think about a lot of it. Um, Maybe I start with one. You showed in your first example that you have three atomic distances um, interaction length for, for your spin excitations. Um, now, does this have any relationship to the correlation length of the Cooper pair, or are these completely different type of spin uh, uh, length scales? Pr probably not directly, because uh, what one knows is that actually the... Uh, the um the, the spin excitations which are probably uh, responsible for the glue there are rather the low energy spin excitations in particular around the uh, antiferromagnetic ordering vector at, at very low energy scale. So, uh, so, so they are um, by this probably not directly involved in uh, the Cooper pair formation but uh, mm. they're nevertheless uh, maybe relevant and actually some of them could be um, responsible that the TC is not going even higher, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Interesting. Please, uh, do we? Yeah, we have a microphone. Please. On the negative charge transfer, uh, I'm just wondering is there any signature, or do you expect there's any signature of the negative charge transfer on the oxygen K Riggs map? On the oxygen? Uh, yeah, not the transition metal part. I know your nice paper of the Nature Com on the nickel. I'm just asking on the oxygen K, uh, when there is an electron loss from the oxygen uh, in that negative yeah. charge, is so, there so, any signature in so, there? So actually, the, 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 the most signature which were, uh, was showing that the nickel L3 data is actually this characteristic form of electron hole pair excitations, so, uh, which one can only uh, explain in this oxygen, oxygen electron hole pair kind of scenario. And uh, th these electron hole pair excitations you indeed see also very, very pronounced at oxygen K. So, uh, so, so basically the oxygen K data uh, is kind of confirming the nickel, uh, the nickel L3 data also in terms of basically uh, assigning uh, uh, the, the negative charge transfer energy. Otherwise, you cannot reconcile these very low energy electron hole pair excitations. So if the oxygen oxygen does not form uh, OO bonding, then that signature will not be there. Yeah, so there would be, the would be charge. not there or at least at much higher energy. Yeah. So, oh. so if you recon reconcile it as a, as a positive charge transfer, then you, there's no way to, to, to reconcile this, uh, 
this, this, this typical electron hole bed tail. I have a second question, which is in your last uh, talk uh, section, uh, you said you have this alternating uh, volume change. Um, and then you measure on the oxygen edge this very complicated phonon spectrum. Is that because the oxygen when S to P excitation drives somehow multiple modes simultaneously? And, and why can you not get selective by, by changing the polarization in the lattice? I mean, is it always so coupled or can you uncouple these modes somehow? So, so I think most of the time will be coupled because, I mean, you, you, you know that you have uh, the different modes, right? I mean, the optical phonon modes, you, yeah, have, yeah. you have different symmetries and uh, when, when they are at least in the neighborhood in energy, they will always uh, couple a lot. And uh, basically so the, the, the clean situation is only when you are uh, in, a, in a lucky situation where they're very, very uh, much more spread by energy. But uh, in, in, in essence, I think most of the time they will be coupled. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to really understand it well and do a reasonable uh, assignment of electron phonon coupling and understanding, you would need at least uh, two or three in some complicated systems. You would need to account for them. Okay. Can so you, you hit question? it hard and then you excite the optical and the acoustic photons all together somehow. Yeah, but, but, but yeah. this okay. is actually already two optical oh. phonons. So acoustic phonons. Are not and, and don't need to go in this fitting because they are nicely separated. Could you have a question? Yeah. Please. We need a microphone. Too. So, Torsten, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, in your example, uh, you disentangle the spin and charge contributions for the tricks based on the azimuthal uh, scans, based on angular dependence. And uh, if I understand well, we compare with the theoretical expectation for purely charge or purely spin excitation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, what are the hypotheses in the model for, to, for doing the calculation and compare with the experiment? I mean, but, but basically uh, what it is, is uh, uh, you, you, you know what is the conditions for uh, exciting spin excitations and uh, uh, the elastic peak, which is charge-like. And this goes very trivial now for a D9 electronic system. So for the cube rates, this is super trivial. Actually, it was boiling down already to understanding the cross-section. In, in the early days after we started with RIGS in, in Switzerland, there was work by Prykovic and uh, Van den Brink, where they were explaining basically the, the spin excitation cross-section and the DD excitation cross-section. and. Uh, uh, you, you, you can kind of, since it's just a, a one electron problem, you can uh, outsource the problem just basically to uh, hydrogen-like uh, uh, wave functions because uh, it's, it's very trivial to, to, to calculate. But the uh, game begins to do this for multi-electron system and so, so far nobody has done it. So, so actually the, the, the next challenge for theoreticians would be to to help us deriving uh, adequate models, for instance, for multi-electron systems in order to do the same things. Um, yeah, or, or some very clever experimentalists who could do that. They could probably, for other classes of systems, contribute a lot. But it's, it, it's clear that it will be much more complicated for multi-electron systems. Julio, do you have a question? Uh, one short question about your last topic on the electron phonon coupling. Is it possible maybe you measured, uh, try to probe the anisotropy of the electron phonon coupling reciprocal space? And whether this, the second question is whether this electron phonon coupling we measure by RICS is the same thing that theoreticians use to describe transport, or we see some things like the exciton phonon coupling and we have to, I don't know, compare these numbers somehow? Differently. It's more like an exit on phonon coupling. That's actually absolutely true. And it was also actually pointed out in this uh, quoted uh, paper by Keith Gilmore. Um, the, the, the first question was uh, anisotropy. So in principle, like the anisotropic uh, spin excitations, you could also think that uh, you, 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 you could see that as well, right? It could, could be anisotropic. You did a measure in this system that uh, electron phonon coupling different points in the reciprocal space for this? 
Yeah, so uh, we, we, we were actually, um, we were not going really on, on, on different direction. <laughs> we were going always just uh, along the ordering direction. Oh, okay. So we were going just along 111, basically, yeah. basically on the same direction of the, the spin order and uh, the uh, um, breathing distortion. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, if you now do a full three, uh, 3D momentum analysis, you could go along different uh, path and do, do the same as we did for the spin excitations and there, yeah. there should potentially, yeah, I, I'm quite sure, there, there, there will be differences, there must be, absolutely. There's lots to do, lots to do. All Very right. nice question. Thank you. With that, we're closing the session. Thanks for your great talk, uh, for the nice discussion. Um, let's move on. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you.